In this great crucible of life we call the world, in the vast one we call the universe, the mysteries lie close packed, uncountable as grains of sand on ocean's shores. They thread gigantic as star-flung spaces. They creep atomic beneath the microscope's peering eye. They walk beside us, unseen and unheard, calling out to us, asking why we are deaf to their crying, blind to their wonder. Sometimes the veil drops from a man's eyes and he sees and speaks of his visions. Then those who have not seen pass him by with lifted brows of disbelief, or they mock him, or if his vision has been great enough, they fall upon and destroy him. That is from The Metal Monster by A. Merritt. Uh, this is the latest uh, in my series of vintage science fiction books uh, that I'll be talking about. Uh, this, The Metal Monster, uh, is by Abraham Merritt, also known as Abraham Grace Merritt, who was born January 20th, 1884, died August 21st, 1943. He was a journalist, he was an editor, he was an all-around busy guy, so he didn't write as many books as I would have liked, I guess, but uh, he, he did what he could. He wrote eight novels, and he wrote uh, a fair amount of short stories that were published in the pulp magazines. So, The Metal Monster, first of all, look at that great cover. So fantastic. Really captures the spirit of this book, that's for sure. Uh, this was published in 1920. It was serialized in one of the really famous old-timey pulp magazines, the Argosy All Story. Uh, and A. Merritt's most famous work was The Moon Pool, and this has a character from The Moon Pool, so it's kind of like a sequel. Uh, Dr. Goodwin from The Moon Pool is in the Himalayas, trying to forget the tragic events of The Moon Pool. And he runs into... Uh, couple of guys and a woman, some fellow adventurers that he just happens to know. What a coincidence. Now, they're all up here in the Himalayas when all of a sudden, uh, they're attacked. Actually, a couple of them are attacked beforehand. And then Dr. Goodwin and this other adventurer, they run into them. Anyway, uh, they're all under threat by these Persians. See, these are the Persians that Alexander the Great chased up into the Himalayas. I don't know how I managed to miss that uh, reading all the ancient history that I did, but apparently this happened. Apparently, Alexander the Great at one point in the past chased a bunch of Persians into the Himalayas. They became a lost race. As lost races, they tend to just, this just happens. They get chased up somewhere and they just become a lost civilization in the pulp magazines. And so, yeah, these lost Persians are up there threatening them. So they have to get away from these Persians and they run into a lost city. Now, A. Merritt, when he wrote Lost Cities, he always did it with a difference. They were always inhabited, usually, by inhuman monsters. And that's what happened in this one. They run into a city full of inhuman monsters. Uh, these are creatures of metal. So they're the, basically these big metal shapes, these cubes and these balls and these pyramids that are just floating around and they can combine into big monster creatures. And uh, there's a beautiful woman in the city because you can't have a lost city without a beautiful woman. Uh, and she's a mysterious beautiful woman that seems to have some kind of leadership role among these creatures. Excuse the siren. Always trouble around here at Stately Vaughn Manor. So anyway, yeah. So it's a lost world story. Let me read the back of the book so you get a sense of what it's about. Metal monsters, metal murders, hidden in the heart of the unknown Asia, were monsters of solid metal, pulsating with an unearthly electronic life. Wise with the wisdom of the world, and dreaming of the day when the harder than steel horde, mountains high, could roll forth, smashing and killing and flattening the world of mere humans. 
four modern American adventurers, three men and a girl, are thrown into this inferno to save mankind from damnation. So, a lot going on in this here lost world adventure. This is a pretty good one. Uh, I like the moon pool, but this probably wasn't as good as that, but this was a lot of fun. Now, Abraham Merritt famously uh, was influential on H.P. Lovecraft. Actually, H.P. Lovecraft uh, knew Abraham Merritt personally, most of the people, most of the writers that Lovecraft knew, he knew uh, by correspondence, but he, he knew uh, Merritt personally. They hung out a couple times, they talked. Uh, and Lovecraft kind of summed up his career, uh, Abraham Merritt's career, in a letter. Uh, and I, I found it, and I just have to read it to you. Let's see here. So this is what... H.P. Lovecraft has to say about Abraham Merritt. Abe Merritt, who could have been a Mackin or Blackwood or Dunsany or De La Mare or M.R. James, if he had but chosen, is so badly sunk that he's lost the critical faculty to realize it. Every magazine trick and mannerism must be rigidly unlearned and banished, even from one subconscious before one can write seriously for educated mental adults. That's why Merritt lost. He learned the trained dog tricks too well. And now he can't think and feel fictionally, except in terms of the meaningless, meaningless and artificial cliches of two-cent-a-word romance. Mackin and Dunson and James would not learn the tricks, and they have a record of genuine creative achievement besides which a whole library full of cheap ships of Ishtar and creep shadows remains essentially negligible. So, even though old Lovecraft knew Abraham Merritt personally, didn't speak very highly of him, uh, I wonder how much of that was Lovecraft trying to distance himself from Abraham Merritt's pulpy work. Because you can see some of the influence in Lovecraft of Merritt. You can. Uh, this guy used a lot of words that Lovecraft liked to use. Cyclopean, for example. Uh, that's a word that they both love to use. The writing style uh, in Merritt is really, really flowery and extravagant. Lovecraft kind of looks like, kind of sounds like Hemingway next to Merritt. Merritt's a little, little, little... He kind of goes overboard uh, with the uh, flowery language. Uh, he never used one word when 12 would do. Uh, I was reading through this, and some of his descriptive scenes are so over-the-top descriptive that I had to read them a couple times just to figure out what the heck was going on, because he's just, he's just out there when he describes things. Uh, but it's kind of cool. It's kind of an interesting read. You could really see what this guy was interested in and what fascinated him. His human characters are boring and just one-dimensional. I mean, they're just, they're, they're pulp fiction characters that could have walked out of any pulp adventure story, his, his characters. But the worlds they encounter are strange and weird and occasionally terrifying. This is one of the more interesting lost worlds that he came up with in this book, The Metal Monster. Uh, his world of intelligent metal creatures and an entire city that was alive. Uh, it was interesting. Um, the, the journey to uh, the city itself uh, is one of the weirdest sequences I've read in a long, long time. It had its 2001 A Space Odyssey moments. Uh, when they were traveling to the city. Um, and the city itself is just bizarre. Uh, it's interesting. Um, so I do recommend this book. Uh, just, just know what you're getting into. Uh, pulp Fiction with a bizarre twist and um, some really interesting description, uh, a bizarre lost world. A lot of fun, this book. Uh, and I enjoyed it. Uh, Abraham Merritt, he, 
he does have a following now. People still remember him, but I, I wonder, I, I kind of wish that he was even better known uh, than he is. Um, his books all have something of value in them, I've found. Uh, his stories are always interesting in one way or another. Uh, easy to look past the pulpy characters because you do get a lot of other interesting stuff in these books. Um, so yeah, I'd like him better than Lovecraft did as far as his fiction was concerned. Apparently, uh, Abraham Merritt was a pretty nice guy. Um, and I, I do wish he had written a little bit, bit more than he did, but like I said, he was busy. He worked hard, this guy, uh, as an editor and a journalist. He had a lot going on. But he loved, he loved science fiction fantasy. And so we do have uh, some of these books. And uh, I'll probably be talking about some more of them in the future. Uh, I've got more Abraham Merritt books down in the vault, so I hope to bring those up to you sometime in the nearish future when you come and visit me once again here at Stately Vaughn Manor. Thanks, guys. I'll catch you next time.